So good afternoon. I'm Scott Kirk, and I have the distinct uh, privilege to manage the Environmental Compliance Department for Savannah River Remediation on behalf of the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, I, before we get started, though, I request that you mute your microphones during the presentation, but we will take questions at the end. Um, now we are um, we welcome our summer interns uh, to our fourth of our five lectures that will address a variety of topics on the profession of health physics. Last week, we listened to Mr. Larry Camper share his professional experience in commercial radioactive waste management in the United States. And as I said before, as most of you are aware, that's our, our summer internship lecture series was expanded beyond the Savannah River site to include students at Georgia Tech, Clemson, the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and Colorado State Universities, as well as other young professionals at the D at DOE headquarters and at other locations across the DOE complex. Last week, we had approximately 80% of participants to dial into our WebEx. We hope that you enjoyed the presentation. We are video recording all of our presentations and hope to have them available on a YouTube channel very soon. This week's lecture is about the United States and the Atomic Energy Agency's nuclear safety activities in Vienna, Austria. will be presented by Dr. Cynthia Jones, who works in the Office of the Commissioners for the U.S. Nuclear Reg Regulatory Commission. I've been in Cindy for years and have admired her professional dedication to the field of health physics and her contributions and service of protecting public health and safety, like so many other professionals working at the Department of Energy, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and our agreement states. To introduce Cindy, uh, Cindy is a senior level advisor for materials for the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Dr. Jones serves as a U.S. Uh, NRC Commissioner Caputo's expert for major policy programs or operational issues associated with nuclear safety, radiation protection, accident, and radiological consequence analysis, safety and security interface, international relations, and advanced nuclear reactors design. From 2012 to 2016, Dr. Jones was a nuclear safety attache supporting the U.S. ambassadors at the U.S. mission to the international organizations in Vienna, Austria, providing programmatic and policy oversight for the International Atomic Energy Agency and the United Nations nuclear safety programs, which will be the subject of her presentation today. Prior to this, Dr. Jones served as the NRC Senior Level Advisor for Nuclear Security from 2003 to 2012, the Senior Level Advisor for Materials to Commissioner Dykus from 1999 to 2012, the Senior Level Advisor for Health Physics from 1996 to 1999, in 2011, she became the first female NRC expert appointed to the U.S. National Council of Radiation Protection and Measurements and most recently served on the Osberg University's Board of Regents, the Georgia Institute of Technology Advisory, <laughs> Nuclear Engineering, and Medical Physics Graduates Program. Dr. Jones has a Ph.D. and a Master of Science in Nuclear Engine Engineering, a Master's of Science degree in Health Physics, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Physics. Cindy, we're just delighted that you graciously offered to share your experience in working in Vienna with us today. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. So thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Can everyone hear me okay? I can. That's great. That's great. Just a reminder for folks, if you have your microphone on, there could be an echo. I see a note from uh, Leslie to turn it off. And I'll start sharing my content of my uh, presentation. Well, first, let me just thank uh, everyone, especially uh, Scott, for putting this together. I know that we have uh, some opportunities uh, for discussion in the last couple of weeks with different activities. And I had the, the great opportunity to spend four years overseas as the nuclear safety attache in Vienna. And there's a lot of um, things that you can look forward to if you're already an existing uh, uh, employee uh, at, a, at a plant or at a facility or if you're in the universities. I understand there's a couple universities from around the country that are listening in or if you're an intern that's looking for adventure outside of uh, these great states of ours, um, please listen ahead and see what we can offer. So first of all, I'll be discussing the U.S. missions in Vienna, of which there are actually three in Vienna. Uh, and a little bit about the activities that the nuclear safety attache has in Vienna, 
which is a, uh, the only posting that the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission has overseas. Um, some of the roles and functions of both the attache and the mission, as well as how it interacts with the international agencies there, and then provide you a bit of, of knowledge and basis um, background for a portfolio should you choose to uh, go overseas or perhaps work with organizations in the United States that do international liaison and diplomatic services. And then a little bit about the IEA regarding, um, which is the International Atomic Energy Agency, basics, nuclear safety and uh, security. And then some goals and opportunities abound for you should you decide to um, move on. So as I mentioned, uh, there are actually three missions in Austria and uh, the U.S. ambassador to Austria, sometimes called the, the main embassy or permanent mission, uh, is the U.S. ambassador to Austria. And they, they promote, as the other two ambassadors do as well, economic and commercial interests, uh, export of American agricultural, industrial products and services. And currently, Trevor Trenya from California is the U.S. ambassador to Austria. There's actually two other missions that are in Vienna as well. One is the U.S. Ambassador to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, or OSCE. And OSCE is a relic of the Cold War days and a legacy of the historic 1975 Helsinki Accord. So for more than 30 years, the commitments to democracy, the rule of law, human rights, tolerance, and media freedom is what uh, has come out of the OSCE. And that current ambassador is James Gilmore III. So while I was in Vienna, I had the privilege and opportunity to work for the U.S. ambassadors to international organizations in Vienna, or commonly referred to as UNVI. Um, UNVI's main mission is to work with the organizations, actually seven main organizations within the United Nations system that are based in Vienna, and we conduct effective multilateral diplomacy with international organs, excuse me, organizations in Vienna to advance the U.S. national interest. And the two that I most prominently dealt with, which you'll hear about today, are the International Atomic Energy Agency and UNSCEAR, which is the UN Scientific Committee on Effects of Atomic Radiation. Some other activities that my diplomatic uh, four uh, officers that I worked with uh, worked with over there were the UN Office of Drugs and Crime and CTBTO, which is the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization. This is the current ambassador, Jackie Walcott, that is the US um, mission ambassador to Vienna. So for the nuclear safety attache position, as I mentioned, it is the only NRC position that serves as the international resident expert on nuclear safety matters. One thing I will mention is that um, UNVI also had three other attaches that were uh, specifically for uh, energy, security, and for safeguard. And those positions are held out of the Department of Energy NNSA office, and they also assisted the ambassador in their areas of expertise. But primarily, we're the eyes and the ears on the ground at uh, in Vienna, and we represent both the NRC and while I was stationed overseas, I actually transferred to the State Department, uh, so became a State Department employee for those four years. And we provide technical expertise, policy recommendations to not only representatives in the U.S. that may be coming over to Vienna, but also to the ambassadors uh, that serve there as well. And during the four years that I was there, it was extremely unusual in that we had a new ambassador every year, uh, which was uh, really quite remarkable. Uh, typically, ambassadors stay there for three or four years, but there was a lot of um, activity going on, certainly the Iran talks, and we had a lot of different activities uh, going on during that time. Um, but one of the things that we do quite regularly is work with agencies that come over for multilateral cooperative agreements and meetings or conferences, such as Department of Energy, uh, Department of State, uh, Homeland Security, Transportation, EPA, as well as other foreign government representatives. This is actually a view from our uh, embassy building from UNVI looking over 
the International Atomic Energy, which is the building off to your right, the curved buildings, uh, very retro, built in the late 1950s, 60s, and uh, it still serves today as the headquarters for the International Atomic Energy Agency. So as I mentioned before, some of the roles and functions of the HSA position, but sometimes if you're in positions at the IEA, you'll have a similar kind of role uh, in policy or management, which is to take a look at new or emerging issues and policies uh, that could be taking place uh, in trying to bridge science and policy. Uh, one thing that I think is extremely important for those of us in the radiation sciences, health physics, or nuclear engineering is uh, when you're working with people who are not necessarily radiation scientists or, 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 or you know, physics people, uh, you need to be able to speak clearly to the issues at hand and advise on, uh, in a very plain language, what uh, the issues you are speaking to and, and to help people understand where your uh, area of interest is and um, activities are with regard to nuclear safety and security in your regulatory uh, structure. So one of the things that we do is to certainly, the ambassador would act, act with foreign government officials, uh, including uh, scientific representatives or heads of nuclear organizations to explain not only what the nuclear regulatory did with nuclear safety, but other US government national and international policies and practices. Uh, one thing I'll mention, which is very unique, is that United States um, has within NRC, the responsibility for safety and security of radioactive sources. In working overseas, we found that many of our other colleagues in other countries have separate uh, agencies that deal with security or with safety. So it uh, can be a very complex, but exciting and rewarding environment. Um, the International Atomic Energy Agency has 171 what's called member states, uh, which are actually countries um, that the United States government works with, as well as um, other agencies within uh, the IEA to provide assistance in, in, um, when, when asked. So if we move on and look at the kind of knowledge basis, as I'm sure those of you that are working in the field or working toward an education in this field know that the area of radiation sciences is very broad and, and very bright, I think. Um, and one of the things is that uh, certainly advanced education is uh, very well thought of and embraced, uh, certainly overseas uh, and domestically. And having knowledge and practical experience, I would say is probably the best bet for your future. It's good to be book smart, but it's extremely important to be knowledgeable and hands-on and have some experiences. So if you can have that in your educational repertoire, that is the best of both worlds. Uh, some of the activities here, which the IEA covers, include reactor safety and security, um, and that's both for power reactors and for research and test reactors, uh, radiation protection, medical, industrial, and academic. Uh, certainly waste management is an issue uh, for many countries, uh, including the United States, transportation, environmental policies and regulation. So now if we turn to the IEA, and this is actually an aerial uh, photo of the IEA showing those curved buildings of the agency, along with the embassy off to the far left with the box kind of sticking out of it. Uh, it was created in 1957 in response to fears and expectations about how the discovery and use of nuclear technology was going to be used worldwide. And the agency's genesis was actually in President Eisenhower's Adams for Peace address to the United Nations General Assembly in December of 1953. So if we look at IEA and their main areas of activity, I'll be primarily focusing today on the safety and security mission, which is the center pillar on the screen. But the three other main activities that they have are safeguards and verification, and by that, you've probably heard in the news with safeguards inspectors uh, in Iran, for example, or other areas to make sure that those uses of nuclear energy or radiation sources are used for peaceful uses. Um, science and technology on the far right, of course, is 
uh, out of the technical cooperation arm at the IEA, and they provide information uh, and technology to countries requesting assistance in those areas. Those thematic priorities are, are throughout the IEA, whether it's in food or agriculture, um, the environment, uh, water, water radiation, for example, or, or energy, and peaceful uses of nuclear technology is a key pillar of IEA in order to assist and provide assistance to member states or countries that want to uh, learn more about this, to be educated more about this, to maybe get assistance, or to share their practices with um, other countries uh, and others so that they can learn and share that knowledge transfer. On the lower right for non-proliferation, uh, again, this is the safeguard system, uh, which um, the IEA has safeguards uh, inspectors that are trained and travel all around the world uh, including the United States, to verify that uh, we are obligated uh, to abide by the international obligations so that we use nuclear science materials uh, and technology only for peaceful purposes. Science, excuse me, safety and security, uh, which is on the lower right-hand side, kind of encompasses all of these things, really. And it ensures that um, IEA can help provide and be a strong and sustainable uh, partner for countries that are looking to enhance or further their programs and work to protect people, society, and the environment from the effects of ionizing radiation. So now if we look at IEA safety standards, on the very top pier of this uh, pyramid, if you will, which you'll see in a second, is the safety fundamental principles. And this is a unique document in that there's 10 safety principles that are applicable throughout the lifetime of a facility or activity, whether it's a new facility or a, an existing facility. And it's designed to recommend and protective actions to reduce those radiation risks. This fundamental safety principle provides the basis for all the recommendations, uh, the regulations that IEA recommends, and the guides that are issued by the IEA. And uniquely so is that the fact that the safety fundamental principles have been jointly sponsored by all these organizations here, which is no small feat, uh, as, as you will see in just a few minutes. This is an example of the IEA General Conference, which is held typically in um, September of every year in Vienna. It has, um, as I mentioned before, 171 member states that come. Each of those are headed by uh, a senior portion of the delegation in the United States, which is usually the Secretary of Energy, and uh, the Chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission also attends, along with a senior delegate from the State Department. So those are our three main area or main agencies that are represented. In addition, there is supporting personnel uh, from uh, those agencies as well as others. Uh, the U.S. delegation was typically around 100 people. Um, and within uh, this entire room, uh, which is always extended for the general conference, it accommodates anywhere between 2,500 to 3,000 delegates or individuals that are representative of those up to 171 member states. Um, in order to allow uh, conversation exchange between countries uh, to have one-on-one -on -one bilateral uh, discussion and agreements on the size of the meeting. And it also allows for those ambassadors or for those heads of delegation to present about a three-minute speech on the activities of their country uh, and what they're doing in safety, security, and safeguards. Currently, the IEA budget uh, for awareness is about 592 million euro, and it does include about 2,600 staff from more than 100 countries. So in addition to the delegates that are attended here, you have all the IEA staff there as well. So this is an example of what we could expect to see uh, at the Board of Governors meeting uh, at the General Conference every year as I mentioned in September, except for this last year that was delayed uh, because of COVID um, and was not held. Uh, there is a report by the Director General on each of the key areas. And this is one of the areas that I covered, which is nuclear and radiation safety. 
Uh, it allows the director general to provide what they've done in the agency safety standards uh, in issuance of documents. Uh, it talks about nuclear installation safety, transport safety, many of those same areas that uh, I covered about knowledge bases earlier in the presentation. Uh, and then uh, discusses capacity building. How are countries um, that are interested or want to expand their program, how can they do that and provide um, assistance and so forth? So that top pillar I mentioned before, uh, the top of the pyramid, the safety fundamentals, those 10 fundamentals, which are um, the primary basis for all the other requirements and safety guides that are developed, um, are really uh, an opportunity for the IEA to build upon uh, lessons learned from around the country, but good regulatory practices from regulators around the country as well. And if we look at these individually, I mentioned the, sen the 10 uh, fundamental principles off to the left, and then we have um, requirements documents, and I'll get to that word requirements documents in a second, uh, on a number of different topical areas, design of nuclear power plants, um, certainly research and test reactors. And these are requirements that IEA has developed, which are approved by um, the Commission on Safety Standards and also at the general conference in order to ensure that protection of the people and the environment are done. And this document has the words shall in it. Um, the other document off to the right, the safety guide, are recommended ways of meeting those requirements. So if we look into that, uh, the safety standards categories, as we compare it to say the US uh, structure, we could say that the safety standards or fundamental principles could be our Atomic Energy Act which gives, for example, the NRC the authority and the mission to make sure that we safely secure radioactive materials uh, in the country and have regulations and infrastructure for that um, maintained. The requirements then would be something like our 10 CFR Part 20 or Part 50, the Code of Federal Regulations that has requirements for licensees to adhere to when they apply for licenses to use certain kinds of materials in a certain way. And then the safety guides are like our regulatory guides or our new reg documents, like the new reg 1556 series, which talk about how to implement a program, how to adhere to best practices, different ways that licensees could adhere to um, our regulatory structure. But a lot of times we'll get questions about, are these really requirements for the US and for other countries? And the answer is, not necessarily. Certainly for the U.S., they are not binding, um, but they can be adopted by them. And in particular, uh, if you look to reg guides or new regs that NRC has issued, you'll see references to IEA safety guides, the basic safety standards, uh, as a reference for users to look at and learn more about other ways of um, using um, uh, recommended practices to implement a certain procedure or a certain activity. Um, but they are binding for IEA's own activities. And by that, I mean uh, they are binding on member states uh, when assisted by the IEA or states that wish to enter into project, project agreements with the IEA. And for example, that could be something as simple as a country um, writes in or uh, contacts IEA and says that they need assistance for um, training their nursing personnel on best practices for handling brachytherapy sources. Um, or they may need assistance in installation of a gamma knife or a teletherapy machine. Or they may need assistance in getting that teletherapy source. Uh, in those cases, the IEA does require that the member state or country has a regulatory infrastructure, has people that are trained and knowledgeable and has a system set up for um, being able to accept that radioactive material, to be able to have a structure and infrastructure so that they're used safely and securely. So for those member states, it is a binding requirement. Now, if we turn over to the nuclear security series, which is a relatively new um, activity since 2006 at the IEA, they have a very similar and parallel structure to the nuclear safety series uh, in that they have fundamentals documents for nuclear security. They have recommendations which set out measures 
that member states should take in order to achieve and maintain that security regime. Uh, implementing guides on how to implement their recommendations and then technical guidance kind of how to implement different portions of that for say safety and security of sources. Um, one of the things that um, is very interesting about this one is, as you heard a few weeks ago from Margaret Cervera, the Code of Conduct on Safety and Security of Radioactive Sources. This is one of the very few documents, but uh, one of the best documents on how safety and security of radioactive sources can be uh, cooperatively worked together within a regulatory structure. It highlights on a very high level, what are the basics that are needed for countries when they implement that re those requirements for sources. And although I mentioned before in our country, the, the Regulatory Commission has both the jurisdiction for safety and security, that's not always the case in other countries. They could be different um, um, organizations, they could be different um, um, regulatory agencies. One could be part of, of a military organization for security, whereas safety is typically in the regulatory uh, arena. So this is a good example of where the U.S. was able to shape um, the levels of activities for the Code of Conduct for Category 1, 2, and 3 sources. I was involved with that early on in the mid-1990s, and it served to last a very good uh, number of years and provide excellent guidance for regulatory countries around the world. So now if we turn to the IEA and how they actually operate when they develop these guidance, we look at a few things. Uh, they do have a commission, which is called the Commission on Safety Standards uh, in the United States. Um, it is held by an individual who's at a very senior level uh, within the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Commission on Safety Standards is typically from um, a regulatory agency. So these are um, the NRCs of the world, if you will. Uh, this position is held by our Deputy Executive Director for Operations. And then when we look at the different kinds of activities throughout the agency um, that they work on, we have these five standing safety committees. And I'll briefly go through that um, so that you can um, learn a little bit more about that. But one of the things that each of these does is um, look at activities that need to be maybe improved or we've had lessons learned on uh, or new uh, innovative modalities that we need new guidance on. Um, it can work both ways. The IEA can go out to a country and, and find that more night guidance is needed or a country such as ourselves or others can contact the IEA and say we need additional guidance or updated guidance on something that's already been issued. And as these um, committees are represented, the Nuclear Safety Standards Committee or NUSC, uh, highlights an activity with regard to nuclear power and research and test reactors. When I came back to the NRC in 2017, I was fortunate to be the NUSC representative for a year since I've been following it for four years at the IEA and uh, work on activities that that committee was doing. Previous to that, I did work with RASP, which is Radiation Safety Standards Committee. That involves areas um, that include um, both medical, industrial, such as well logging, um, radio, uh, industrial radiography, and so forth. And Waste Safety Standards Committee, or WAST, uh, last week you heard from Mr. Larry Camper. Uh, Larry was the international uh, representative from NRC on WAST for many years. And what we do there, as well as the other committees, is share UX experience to other countries developing this guidance. And also we ensure that any guidance that is developed is complementary to our existing regulatory structure. Transportation Safety Standards Committee or TRANS. Uh, in the US, we are uh, unique in that we have two regulatory agencies that have responsibility for radiation transport. The Department of Transportation has regulations for that as well as the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So in this case, we had two representatives, DOT taking the lead, but NRC also attending uh, to make sure that it's um, in, in line or complementary to our existing regulation. And then within the last uh, five or so years, I guess now maybe it's eight years, we have uh, the EPRES committee, the Emergency Preparedness and Response Standards Committee. And that was a committee that was established while I was overseas um, at UNVI. 
uh, between 2012 and 2016 as a new committee uh, in large part because of the activity following Fukushima and the importance of preparedness um, for countries to um, be prepared not only for those countries that have larger uh, nuclear installations, but also for sources. And one thing I'll, I'll show here is that the IEC, uh, which is known as the Incident Emergency Center at IEA, very similar to NRC's Operations Center, but it is a global focal point for emergency preparedness and response. And by that, uh, I mean that if there is a, an accident or an incident that happens in one country, certainly we, we all want to help and assist, and IEC serves as that focal point to receive the questions from that country or countries for assistance through the Assistance Convention, which is one of those uh, binding conventions that we all um, have adhered to, including the U.S. And we um, have volunteers that are from NRC, DOE, and the National Labs that can assist in these events and accidents around the world. But it is upon request. One of the things I've, I've highlighted here, of course, is uh, the website where there has been, uh, certainly over the past 20, 30 years, many publications um, that the IEA has looked into uh, regarding a wide range of um, incidents that have occurred. And while we all know that um, we can use radiation safely, uh, securely, and, and we hope in a very safe manner, uh, in some cases where there is a large um, radioactive source, such as in radio teletherapy or in industrial radiography, while these accidents are very, very few and infrequent, um, they can cause severe consequences, uh, radiation burns, for example. And what this shows you is just a few of the incidents that have been uh, blogged by the IAEA. Uh, they offer assistance to member states, as I mentioned, through its assistance convention. Uh, they gather international experts from around the world when countries request assistance, for example, the assistance uh, to the Georgia accident. Um, they certainly will offer assistance through um, medical uh, physicians, um, typically in France or in Argentina, or through REACTS, which is our um, U.S. Uh, radiation effects assistance training site in Oak Ridge, which has physicians who are trained in radiation response. And these um, case-specific reports aim to strengthen safety by uh, sharing lessons learned uh, to prevent accidents in the future. On the upper right, I'll just note that there is a very large compendium uh, for the Fukushima Daiichi accident. For those of you that want to have more information about that event, uh, I would highly recommend it. It is about uh, 1,250 pages. Uh, it has a lot of information. There is a, a one, uh, one of them is a, an overview of that uh, publication of all five uh, volumes, but uh, I had the privilege and honor to work on that um, and was asked to be one of the authors for the section on occupational and public doses um, that occurred after Fukushima. And we were able to go to the local jurisdiction and get information that even at the time had not been available to, for example, even UNSCEAR. So we were able to work with the local prefectures in getting information, assimilating that and putting it in this publication for others to read about, but they're, they're very good publications overall. I highly recommend that you take a look. So now, how does this all work together? I mentioned before that we have um, the international uh, conventions, or these are legally binding conventions for um, uh, countries with the IEA. Uh, a few that I've listed here, CNS is the Convention on Nuclear Safety. Uh, which is primarily for reactors, research and test reactors. Uh, the Joint Convention, which is on the safety of spent fuel and radioactive waste management. There's a Convention on um, the Physical Protection of Nuclear Materials, which is CPPMN, and there's a few others. Those are their legal international instruments that are being underneath the safety and security framework. And then off to the upper right, I mentioned the codes of conduct. The one earlier was on the safety and security of real radiation sources. Uh, there is another code of conduct for research reactors, but codes of conduct are not legally binding. They are 
um, a, a mechanism that the country, in this case, the United States, writes into the IEA and say, we are going to adhere to the code of conduct, and we put that in writing to the IEA. Uh, so as we move down uh, the page, we see the safety standards and security guidance off to the left, which helps with um, certainly our, our work with the conventions. And off to the right, I, we see something called IEA safety reviews and services. And one thing I haven't touched upon, because we only have an hour uh, for discussion today, is that IEA does, <clears throat> excuse me, a number of uh, regulatory review missions and services for countries that request it. Um, for example, uh, one that is the largest one, which is the Integrated Regulatory Review Service. Uh, that is typically called the IRRS, uh, which involves a number of um, individuals, up to 30 or more, um, depending on the country, uh, for two weeks to come to the country and look at, from the top to the bottom, how that regulatory structure is working, how it operates, how that country has a program of regulation, enforcement, inspection, uh, and how the regulator itself is independent from that arm of, say, promoting nuclear energy. Uh, one of the basis of the reason why we're no longer part of the AEC is that NRC and DOE were separated so that one agency can promote nuclear, which is DOE, and one that does not, which is NRC, and we have independent regulatory authority. Um, those IRS missions um, are very uh, time intensive. NRC has had one a few years ago. Uh, typically takes at least a year, a year and a half to prepare a lot of um, answers to questions from IEA. IEA then gathers international regulatory safety experts from around the world, and then they come to your facilities uh, for about two weeks issue or review, which is then made uh, public um, to discuss what they found in, in the states and to highlight best practices and lessons learned. So as we look at this global knowledge network, we look at the very bottom tier, which is that yellow box. Um, for example, in our country, this is how we uh, do our national infrastructure for safety and security. This is how NRC operates. We have regulations, enforcement, and inspection authority. We also do research. Uh, we do educate uh, a lot of the training, um, and then some of the education and training is done by DOE as well. Um, and then we have operation and use of those facilities. So we, we all regulated it. But now when we look at it in practice, we also look at some other things that are done by the IEU. And in, in fact, not only beside those recommendations, those requirements, those safety guides, there's other safety reports that are issued um, by the IEA. And these are some of the ones that are listed there. Um, some are issued by uh, the Department of Nuclear Energy at the IEA. And they're called the Nuclear Energy Series documents. Some are tech docs or technical documents. And I'll just note that there are many tech docs that are issued um, they don't have the level of review or approval such as the safety guides, but they're, they are there for um, providing lessons learned and get best practices in short order out to folks to know how to implement, for example, um, a, um, a certain activity or scope. Now, if we look at all of the safety standards, yes, you see it all. You see, this is the safety standards real poster. And I can see Scott smiling. I'm sure a lot of you are smiling. There will not be an exam on this. But as you can see, there are many, many activities, uh, facilities, uh, thematic areas that IEA has with regard to issuance of documents just in radiation safety. And to help uh, your eyes and mine out a bit, I focused in on just one area, transport, fuel cycle, and radioactive waste disposal facilities. You'll see the green-coded um, uh, guidance documents uh, there. And you'll also see, um, as we move closer, that, that main basis of all these documents, which is the fundamental safety principles, those 10 principles, which all these documents are based from. And then you have uh, different uh, requirements documents, which are in red, that go around uh, the wheel, the wheel of fortune, perhaps um, for these facilities. So there just are 
many. So if you're, if you're working on a research project or you're working on a different kind of new modality, maybe in medicine, please take a look at the IEA website. Uh, you know, Dr. Google is pretty good, but IEA is not bad either. And they'll probably have a document that will help you uh, in your course of work. And so how do we get to this? Well, it's a step-by-step -step process. This is uh, usually uh, 11 or 12 steps from uh, initiation of the idea to um, developing um, a plan of work to an outline to then IEA reaching out to member countries to see who is interested in that activity, organizing meetings at the IEA. Now they're probably organizing meetings uh, via video conference. Um, but uh, there is a, a wealth of information worldwide, and once you're in a group of, of similar experts uh, like yourselves from different countries learning best practices, you find that not only uh, uh, the United States has ideas for things, but other countries have ideas, and together you end up with a better project uh, that is, is useful. But it is a very, uh, can be a very long process. Some of these documents take um, three to four years or three to five years. And then, as I mentioned, those upper tier documents must be uh, reviewed and approved by the Safety Standards Committee and then some even by the CSS for approval. So lots of, lots of opportunity. I'll turn now briefly uh, with the remaining time um, to just mention UNSCEAR, which is the United Nations Scientific Committee on Effects of Atomic Radiation. Uh, and this was established um, by the General Assembly in 1955. Uh, it has issuance of many different kinds of uh, reports, and it assesses and reports on levels and effects of exposure to ionizing radiation on a periodic basis. Um, it does have senior scientists from 27 UN member states, and annually it did hold its session in Vienna, of which I had the opportunity to participate in. The link below is um, of their website. You can learn more uh, after this presentation. But in particular, I'll just highlight, they've had 25 major publications, very good reports, very thick reports, very detailed. Uh, certainly uh, previous reports on Chernobyl, even a, a one that was done um, 10 years after Chernobyl uh, was reissued. Uh, lessons learned from uh, Fukushima. Uh, and then updated periodic reports, as I mentioned, on sources, effects, and risks of ionizing radiation. One uh, particular one that's of interest for those of you in the medical community is medical radiation exposures uh, and also what kinds of exposures individuals are getting from various sources around the world, including um, natural sources of radiation, which, as you know, in some cases the world can be relatively high in comparison to what we regulate. Um, for um, radioactive sources. Uh, and I'll mention this, this last report, uh, which is on the um, attribution of health effects um, for uh, ionizing radiation. Uh, it is a, a particular um, report that was issued recently uh, in 2015, but because of uh, publication with the Fukushima report was issued uh, physically later, like around 2017, 2018, and it highlights the concepts of attributability, uh, inference of risk, and use of collective dose. Uh, one of the things that's important about it is that it touches on the three pillars of justification, optimization, and graded approach, and what is attributable to uh, the radiation sources. Uh, it does touch on low doses and uncertainties associated with low doses, uh, and uh, the LNT hypothesis, and it's used in ra radiation safety. Um, but in particular, it has a very good section on challenges that we all have in communication of radiation benefits and risks. And if you're interested in the LNT hypothesis or use or how to communicate in this low dose range, I, I highly recommend that you take a look at that. So where shall you be next? Uh, this is actually a picture of um, Palace Aschenbrunn. It's outside of Vienna. Uh, just give you an opportunity to uh, think about goals uh, for, the, for the time ahead, um, both from a diplomatic and, and technical perspective. As I mentioned before, I actually transferred to the State Department for four years uh, with my attache position and got to work very closely with the diplomats 
uh, of the State Department who work uh, for the embassies and ambassadors around the world in promoting uh, U.S. Uh, interests. And um, State Department is always very interested, as is NRC and DOE and all the other um, federal agencies in hiring good technical people to work with um, uh, their colleagues in um, being able to describe very clearly uh, what we do uh, from a technical perspective uh, to the diplomats and to also promote um, and explain to other countries uh, what we do in this area. Uh, when you're at the IE, of course, uh, cooperative areas uh, for activities, certainly meetings with multilateral organizations in other countries are, are just at your hands. Uh, in preparing for this, this talk, I noted that there was over 120 embassies in Vienna. We have about 170, 74 in Washington, D.C. So you see that Vienna is a very large area and a very key area for cooperative engagement with multilateral organizations. And my colleagues from the other um, embassies, the attaches, were typically not uh, of a technical nature. They were diplomatic service corps. So again, there's an opportunity to bridge the gap between policy and science. Uh, for um, these opportunities, um, both abroad and here, of course, you have the key areas for safety, security, and safeguards. And radiation protection needs are, are universal, right? We, we know what we can do in this country. We know what we can share with others. But what you may not know is what you can learn from others. And that's, that's the beauty of being overseas and to see that um, what we have here is, is outstanding, no doubt. But we can always uh, have continuous improvement, as my, uh, my Swiss friends would continue to say. And the landscape is always changing. We have new modalities in medicine. Uh, we're always on the forefront for that. We can help countries uh, with guidance documents in those areas. So not that I want any of you to leave your current jobs, but this will try to focus on the uh, students that are at university or interns. I'll give you a couple ideas on where you can look for um, opportunities. And this is interesting in that while I was over there, I, I realized that State Department had partnered with IEA's Programs Department at Argonne National Laboratory, which is outside of Chicago. And they serve as the interface between IEA and the U.S. nuclear community in promoting U.S. professionals. Now, the U.S. Uh, is very interested, the embassy certainly at UNVI, very interested in getting U.S. professionals in career position paths overseas. Uh, and one of the things that is on this website is uh, an idea of what the benefits are to living overseas. I'll mention one benefit that uh, IEA staff have, um, US um, IEA staff have that I didn't have, which is uh, it is tax-free uh, when you are working at the IEA and you are a US individual. And I should be careful to say that's federal taxes. If you're in a state that has taxes, you still must pay your, your state tax, but um, up to about $120,000 thereabouts, it's tax-free uh, for the time that you're over at the IEA. So it, it can be a big bonus. Um, they also, if you have young children, can offer to pay for education uh, and even for education of your college students. So a number of people go over with their children that are in high school age, uh, get opportunities at the IEA, and those students then have an opportunity, uh, those children of families, uh, for educational assistance and tuition. But this site is very good for um, talking about the free screening process, how to put in an application. And, and with that, I'll say, um, take a look at this uh, website uh, and uh, learn a little bit more. Uh, one thing that you can do directly, which is, is very simple to do and you can have in your back pocket, is to go directly to the IEA's website for um, posting your resume. Actually, you take the information from your resume and you post it on their system, which is called Calio. Uh, and in this case, it's, it's really a very good um, uh, website in that you take your resume, you take your experience, your educational um, uh, background, and you put it into the website. Uh, you explain a little bit about your areas of expertise, what areas you'd like to work in. On the left-hand side of the column, you can select areas that you'd like to work in. Um, whether it's in Vienna at the IEA headquarters, or it could be at 
one of the two um, labs that the IEA have. There's one in Cybersdorf, which is outside Vienna, or if you're in uh, marine or radiobiology, you might want to go to Monaco, which is their other lab, which would be a beautiful place to go to. I didn't have the opportunity to go there, but it, it looks like a great place to work. Um, but you can put in where you want to work, and you can put in an idea of what kind of um, positions you're interested in, and then you'll get notifications from the Talio system that there is an opportunity at IEA that you can apply on. And then you simply click the application button, it'll load up your resume, you answer the questions like you would do on, on um, a US site as well. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't include uh, certainly the website for uh, the federal government's opportunity for jobs, and I will offer that NRC is hiring right now. We have a number of retirements that have happened uh, certainly over the years and will continue to grow. Um, USA Jobs website is uh, the one-stop shop for uh, getting um, your application into a position, certainly for NRC, DOE, and other federal agencies. Uh, you can search for keywords, um, put in your information, um, and one thing I would offer for all of you listening, uh, including more senior people that are listening on, on this uh, webinar, is that I, I had an opportunity and the privilege to work for former Commissioner DePlanck, Yale DePlanck at the NRC. And she told me early on in my career, always have your resume available within 15 minutes of being asked. Always have it updated and available within 15 minutes. And that has been some of the best advice that I've ever received and I pass it on to you. Uh, and so uh, maybe not during your work hours, but maybe during your lunch break or evening and weekend, uh, update it and have it ready to go in 15 minutes. So with that, I leave you uh, with another beautiful picture of uh, Vienna's uh, lower gardens of uh, Palace uh, Belvedere uh, and um, would offer, uh, again, it's a great place to live. There's opportunities both abroad and here, and you have a lot in your future and a lot to share. So with that, um, I thank Scott and everyone else for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, Cindy, that was fabulous. I can't believe how comprehensive your presentation was. <laughs> and you. it was it was just a delight to have you here and share your experiences with us. Um, I know that will be invaluable to our interns and our young professionals. And so I'm going to turn it over to my staff, uh, Leslie Wooten, who's an Environmental Science Authority, and have her um, go through the questions and answers with you guys. So with that, go ahead, Leslie. All right. Good, af good afternoon now, I guess, everyone. Um, if everybody could use the hand raise function to start off to ask questions, that way we're not talking over anyone. Uh, I see Frank England has his hand raised. Go ahead, Frank. Dr. Jones, for uh, three years, I was assigned in Germany as a State Department trial observer, and one of my duties was to brief uh, um, American government employees working overseas on the status of poison rules for the German Supplemental Agreement to the NATO SOPA. And I just wondered uh, if you could share any practical tips uh, for our interns who may be looking for these kinds of jobs, uh, like international driver's license or any experiences you had that might be practical living tips while they're working uh, overseas? Sure. Um, let me fix my screen for a second. I see a picture of, uh, let's see. One of the things I would offer is that we, we, we typically, when we have folks that go over, um, there's a lot of networking that's going on. Uh, certainly in Vienna, there is an organization called um, American Citizens in Vienna, um, but there's just a lot of opportunity for um, you to go over to um, having a position overseas uh, that um, will build upon your career that you have here and allow you to either come back to the United States and, and share that experience. Or in many cases, as we've seen people that have gone over in the Diplomatic Service Corps, they move on to other areas in other countries. For example, we've had people that are radiation scientists that are in um, Germany uh, that got opportunities in Belgium and in France. Uh, it gives you an opportunity 
to learn another language, become immersed in that language, and um, and just get uh, an opportunity that you can get here. Uh, the other thing is that um, many national laboratories have uh, opportunities and work that is overseas. So if you in, are employed with um, uh, certainly State Department, NRC, I'm able to travel around the world for NRC during uh, capacity, uh, both as a junior professional, as a senior professional, uh, to have collaboration. And when there is an event that occurs, you can uh, help calm the fears of many others if you have those collaborative work arrangements with international uh, context uh, in the future. Thanks, Cindy. All right, uh, Aaron White, I see your hands raised. All right, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, first of all, great presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I have kind of two questions for you. The first one would be, uh, what were some of your favorite projects that you got to work on um, overseas? And then the second question was, I know you mentioned um, getting access to some of these IAEA positions um, through the universities and through the national laboratories. When I was, when I first got hired with DOE, um, I saw the website for the IAEA and applied for, I don't know, dozens of positions and didn't even get a, a sniffle on um, one of those types of positions. So my second question would be, what are some of the experiences that you would recommend that you would need to have to uh, be competitive for one of those positions? Sure. Well, um, so as far as favorite projects, uh, there were really two when I was overseas. Uh, one was uh, working on the uh, Fukushima report, as I mentioned before. Uh, that was a unique situation. I had just gone over to um, to take the HSA position when a request came in for me to be a, a technical writer on that report. So that was like double double duty, and um, it was a, a privilege really to work with um, the international group that I had. I had an individual from TEPCO uh, on my committee. Uh, individual from NNSA and uh, also one from Israel that jointly worked on writing this report, which was about almost a two-year process. It was a lot of work, a lot of uh, assimilation of numbers, and it's a, it, we're all very proud of the report and, and its factual basis. Um, the other one was um, the Convention on Nuclear Safety, um, which was a, a meeting that typically happens periodically, I think every three years, um, but at one of the uh, convention meetings. Uh, there was a proposal by um, the Swiss to uh, make a change to the convention, which was a, a very, a very serious thing in that it would have um, made quite a bit of, uh, it, it could have made change to a very sound convention. Uh, one of the recommendations that came out of that meeting was that there was going to be a diplomatic conference held, which was held about 11 months later. Uh, the U.S. Uh, really worked very hard with its um, partner countries uh, to uh, work with um, then Ambassador uh, Rafael Grossi, who is the chair of that um, conference, to be able to uh, come up with a declaration which was agreed upon by all uh, 77 contracting parties uh, in less than a day. So it was a, a very urgent, high-level um, political issue uh, over over scoping a technical issue. And that was a, a very interesting uh, project to do. If you're interested, take a look at the declaration uh, from the CNS conference in 2015. Um, with regard to your comment on applying for positions, uh, one thing I didn't mention is that the IEA has um, a, a really a responsibility to have um, a number of people from all over the world within their organization. As I mentioned, there's like 2,600 people representing 100 countries. So although the U.S. has its, its fair share of, of technical and scientists, uh, we can't uh, necessarily inundate, say, a medical section that has 15 people with a lot of people from the U.S. We have to make sure, and they make sure, I should say, that there are people from different uh, nationalities 
different countries, different areas of the world so that they have that balance. That being said, um, if you have a second language uh, that you know, um, uh, that's helpful. Um, German is my second language. Um, I could speak it better, uh, but I, I can get by very well. Um, certainly, um, having that on your resume when you apply is important. Uh, I would also say apply frequently and often. Uh, you probably will not get uh, the first uh, time you apply, you won't get accepted to go through. It's a process. Um, and in many cases, some of these applications have several hundred applicants. Um, that being said, work with um, Argon, who is your, your assistant and your spokesperson, if you will. Um, they can help promote U.S. citizens if there is only one U.S. citizen on the short list. Uh, even the ambassador can go so far as to support you if there is only one U.S. citizen on a very uh, senior list, such as a, a division director or um, um, D1 position, but um, it's it's important to have variety. And if you're at uh, DOE and you can have opportunities in different projects, um, that's also very good. Um, working with the labs is very good because uh, they have uh, presence overseas. But but don't give up. And there's uh, there's opportunities that are around the corner. You just may not know they're there. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I see a question from Anne. Uh, yeah, just going off of that question, uh, is there are there any languages that are more sought after or preferred, or really just any to have variety in your application? Well, um, I guess from the from the medical perspective, I would it's just a personal view. I would say Spanish. Um, we have a lot of uh, Latin American countries that are really um, accelerating their medical uh, programs, treatment, diagnostics. Spanish is, is very uh, widely spoken in the world. Um, I would say maybe next, hmm, I don't know, French probably would be the other one because we have all the, the nationalities within Africa region, certainly the Pacific area with the French islands. Uh, a lot of countries uh, speak uh, French. And so if you can um, have uh, those languages in your back pocket, that certainly will help. Uh, I would think in, in uh, looking at a, a array of applicants for a position, uh, especially if you're looking for someone in technical cooperation where you're actually going to the country to help give uh, delivery of a course in radiation protection or training or help um, put together uh, a device that is paid for by the IE in that country. Um, they typically don't have um, individuals that are translators. They rely on their staff for that or the staff of the country. Good question, though. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Are there any other questions for Cindy before I hand it over to Scott? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, if not, I'll hand it over to Scott for closure and thanks so much for the presentation, Cindy. You may get a lot of applications. My bad. <laughs> is hiring, so. <laughs> hey, well, first of all, thank you to all of our participants today. I know you enjoyed that. Cindy, it was great having you and hosting you today. Um, it was great seeing you, even if it's only on the computer screen, but I hope that our paths cross very soon. I hope so. Yeah, thanks a million. I really appreciate that. Everybody take care. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, Scott. You as well. You're welcome.